One of my favorite songs, you might say of all time, uh, just on my own favorite, is a song called What a Wonderful World. Louis Armstrong made that song famous. It became a, a, a big hit back in 1967. I was 12 years old. Now, I didn't hear the song when I was 12 years old, but many years later, I kind of fell in love with that one song. The lyrics begin like this. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and for you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Another verse goes like this. The colors of the rainbow, so pretty in the sky. You can hear the melody in your mind if you know the song. Are also on the faces of people going by. <laughs> I see friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? They're really saying, I love you. Again, just one of my own personal favorites. The song lyrics, like many other well-composed songs, create a mental picture for us. What a Wonderful World describes a recognition of some of the little things in life that give joy. In the midst of all the sadness and the turmoil in the world we have around us. The song speaks to a life work worth living and of the beauty we can find in creation and the beauty we can find in our fellow human beings. Words mean things. That was an often repeated statement from a popular AM radio talk show host, Rush Limbaugh, who died just over a year ago at age 70, 2021. Words mean things, he would say, quite often. Words are the principal carrier of meaning, the fundamental vehicle of conveying thoughts and ideas in any society. And this form of communication, words, either spoken or written, connects us together into the very fabric of relationship building in the world. When you and I speak, it is our words that give the most important impression of ourselves after the very first impressions. When we see someone, first of all, it's our physical appearance, the clothes we're wearing, how we look is the very first impression we give people. The very next impression we give people are the words that come out of our mouth, the things we say. Playwright and novelist Edward Lytton wrote for a stage play back in the 1800s, the pen is mightier than the sword. Sigmund Freud, the psychologist, wrote, words have magical power. They can either bring the greatest happiness or the deepest despair. John Keating, an influential English teacher, said, no matter what anyone tells you, words and ideas can change the world. It has been said that learning to communicate with each other is the most important skill in life. Now, I didn't uh, come up with that idea, but uh, it is a very important skill to learn in life, how to communicate with one another. We spend most of our waking hours communicating, yet many people struggle to really learn how to master the spoken or the written word in constructive ways. In this split sermon, I'd like to share with you how we can make a difference in the lives of others through the power of our words. Very simple title today, Words mean things. Words mean things. And I'll share just three points on this otherwise huge subject. I won't turn, but I'll start in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 2. Paul writes about a number of characteristics that will plague the last generations of this age before Christ's return. Think on how many of the negative elements as I read these to you that have to do with communication have to do with words. Yes, they are attitudes and matters of the heart. But as I read them, think about how words are involved. 2 Timothy 3, verse 2 through 4, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, well, there's one, proud, well, that can show itself in a variety of ways, words too, 
blasphemers, words. Disobedient to parents, well, words could be involved there. Unthankful, yeah, the lack of words in that one. Unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, words are involved. Without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now, I kind of conservatively, about 11 out of those 18 have to do with communication, how we speak, how we convey thoughts to one another. We live in an information age, sometimes overwhelming. The pioneers of the information age are largely the baby boomers that came earlier on summer in this room, some baby boomers, who developed technologies mainly beginning in the 1970s. Some of us will remember the mainframe computers that were in large corporations, big giant refrigerator size uh, computers with these, these spinning uh, reels of tape. And uh, they slowly began to go from just crunching numbers and data to more sophisticated uh, software and programs, and then there came the PC, the personal computers into people's homes, and then the software became more and more powerful, the applications, and then as they started getting more powerful, we saw digital art, we saw gaming and other entertainment, and then by Generation X, those born between 1965 and 1980, have, seen the, have been the greatest utilizers of this technology a huge growth in the utilization of this as it came down to uh, personal convenience and in-home use. Then came the internet, then came smartphones, then came tablets and PDAs, personal digital assistants, and all those other electronic things that people love to tote around, including myself. Oh, man, my iPhone is one of the most fascinating technological breakthroughs I have in our house. I love it. I mean, it was so well designed. Look at all the things you could do with it. <laughs> well, it allowed people to access information at the touch of a button, stream news, podcasts, video, lots and lots and lots of video, good or bad. Not to speak of the social media platforms, the TikTok, the Instagram, the Twitter, the Facebook, etc. We are definitely in an information age. I believe that in the millennium, so much of this is going to be simple simplification of our lives. Anyway, we live here. It's what we have. We live in a society where such an enormous barrage of information, and when I'm preparing messages to speak, I'll go on the internet and look for facts and figures and data and stories. I can get enveloped for hours reading things. I'm thinking, wow, this one story led to this story, led to this documentary, led to this. And I love it, but yeah, I have to kind of um, curtail some of that. One of the prophetic indicators, of the end time found in Daniel 12.4, I won't turn, Daniel 12.4, very well-known passage. It says, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. We definitely live in that age, don't we? One dilemma with the overload of information is words tend to become cheaper and cheaper. We know that the shock value of offensive words on TV and media and our music day after day can desensitize us. They can cause us to become numb to the things that are said, the words, the attitudes, the profanity. We can become desensitized in time. Slowly but incessantly, if we're not on our guard, we wish we could shield our children and our teens from the offensive language and media and the hallways of our schools. We wish we could. We know so much rhetoric on, in the political arena amounts to empty promises and the growing distrust. That's the reality of the society we're living in now. But we, as individuals, can do something on a personal level about it. We can do things about this. So I have three points. Now I'm going to share a few more than normal scriptures for a split sermon, but you're going to see most of them are in the Proverbs. Most of them are single sentences. Most of them go in a sequence. Very easy to, to follow along with me in your Bibles. Point number one, our words 
can bring healing. Our words can bring healing. I would like to turn to James 3 and verse 5. James 3 and verse 5. And as you're turning with me, our words have the power to either tear down relationships or build them up. Words can be a powerful raging fire, as James will describe here, or words can be the bridges that heal and restore and build up and bring life. Some of the comments in this message are going to be a parallel in the theme of Mr. Lydon's message on kindness. James 3, let's start in verses 5 through 10. Even so, the tongue is a little member that boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles? And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hellfire, Gehenna, the, the, uh, the fire pit that used to burn all the rubbish in ancient Israel, it was never, uh, never put out. It was constantly people would take their carts and horses up to the edge of a cliff and dump all their rubbish into a fire uh, at the bottom of the pit and it would just burn and burn and burn and burn. So that's what he's talking about, hell, hellfire here. Uh, the hellfire is also Gehenna uh, of the uh, ultimate hellfire. Verse 7, for every kind of beast and bird, a reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. It takes a lot of skill. There are several other passages that show that it, it is something to strive for. Uh, it's not like throw in the towel and say it's hopeless. I can't change my, my profanity. I can't change my words. I can't change the things that blurt out of my mouth. No. The Bible is full of examples of how to grow in these areas. But James is making a very poignant point. It's a deadly poison if it's let go loose, the human tongue. Verse 9, we bless, it, uh, we bless our God and Father with it, and we also curse men who have been made in the similitude of God, the very likeness of God. Verse 10, out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursings. My brethren, these not ought to be so. Proverbs 18, verse 21, I'd like to move over to Proverbs 18, verse 21. James very likely got this um, part of this passage we just read to you, or read together from Proverbs 18, verse 21. Solomon wrote, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat of its fruit, either the fruit of wickedness or the fruit of righteousness, either one. Words in our day generally don't carry the same dignity, the weight of dignity and decency that they did in former generations. U.S. News and World Report polled Americans in April of 1996. They found that 89% of Americans think civility was a serious problem. And that, again, was in 1996. 89% of Americans, civility is a problem. Ten years after that survey, 2006, another survey refreshed that, and it showed that more than three out of four said that it was increasing, that incivility in society was getting worse. USA Today, December of 1996, ran a cover story. Quote, wanted, good citizens, close communities. The subhead was, it's becoming impossible to ignore the growing rudeness of American life. Now again, we realize we live in perilous times. And as I mentioned already, there are things we can do. But you look around us, and we live in the wealthiest land in the world. And history of past societies shows that, show that when people enjoy a long run of prosperity, and yes, overindulgence in many cases, it tends to overtake humility with pride and arrogance, and thankfulness gets replaced by ah, entitlement. I have it coming. I, I should be living this way. I should have all these, these benefits and perks. Unthankfulness is a penchant of a society that has been blessed for so long. Then civility declines. 
a lot of bad behavior results. Dignity and decency in words follow suit, or that's all part of it. It's a decline in people's speech. We see this all, this all around us in the media, TV, news, printed media, social media. Please come back to Proverbs 15, verse 23. Again, we're going to go through some of these Proverbs very quickly, but each one of them is a jewel, a precious morsel of truth for gaining wisdom and understanding on God's way of life and how to bring success into our own lives. Proverbs 15, verse 23, it shows us that carefully chosen words bring joy and peace and uplifting. Verse 23 says, a man has joy by the answer of his mouth and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. Proverbs 12, verse 25, just a couple pages over. Proverbs 12, verse 25, anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. It sounds like something right out of a clinical journal. I mean, it was written in, at least in the New King James version as if it was something written by a modern day uh, doctor or, um, or a psychologist. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. You see that words are so powerful to help produce emotional healing, calm fears, and uplift those who are suffering, and it can promote physical healing uh, in, a, in different ways. Proverbs 25, verse 11. Proverbs 25, verse 11. By long forbearance, a ruler is persuaded, and a gentle tongue breaks a bone. The mental imagery here is that uh, the word is more powerful than the sword. Again, from a playwright. It shows the power uh, that spoken words or written words have with positive and entreating and humble words. If you're going before a dignitary who has a great deal of power, like a king did in times of uh, sovereign kings where their law was absolute, then we definitely learn to be humble and gracious in our words in those cases. And we should be that way anyway to any people of any state of life and stature in life. Here's a quote from the well-known book from Stephen Covey. He wrote many books on uh, achieving success. This one was Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And uh, Stephen Covey wrote, page 78, he had habit number one out of seven habits here. It was on being proactive, being proactive. And it all centers around our language, our, our, our ability to communicate positively or negatively. All right, so Stephen Covey's book, Habit Number One, he compares examples of reactive people to proactive people in how they think and communicate. And he gives an illustration of one of his large seminars where many people came to listen to Stephen Covey talk on success and um, promoting his seven habits. And after it was over, a man came up to him from the crowd and asked him a question. He says, uh, Stephen, I, I have this frustration in our marriage with my wife. We've been married for a number of years, but I just don't feel the spark anymore. The, 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 the love, the passion is gone. What can we do to uh, re-spark re, re or you know, reignite that passion in the past? Stephen Covey looks at him and says, love her. He says, no, no, you don't understand. No, we, we, we have this issue where we're just getting further apart. We're just not, uh, we just don't feel the same way as we used to about each other. I don't know, we're just kind of st getting stale in our marriage. Really, think about that. What should we do? Love her. All right, so he's completely confused about this. He says, then, love her. Listen, he says to the man, love is a verb. You're thinking about love, the feeling, the fruit of love. But in great literature of all progressive societies, love is a verb. Reactive people make love a feeling. 
They're driven by feelings. Hollywood has generally scripted us to believe that we're not responsible, that we are a product of our feelings. But the Hollywood script does not describe the reality. If our feelings control our actions, it's because we've abdicated that responsibility and empowered our feelings to control our actions. Proactive people, he says, make love a verb. Love is something you do, the sacrifices you make, the giving of self, like a mother bringing a newborn baby into the world. If you want to study love, study those who sacrifice for others, even for people who offend or do not love in return. Have we heard that principle in the New Testament Gospels somewhere? Yes, indeed, of course we have. Love is a value that is actualized through loving actions over just feelings. Proactive people do this, unquote, again. Something from one of Steve Covey's habits uh, in the seven habits of highly effective people. Good and positive words bring emotional healing, which again can impact physical healing to some degree. Proverbs 12, verse 18. Proverbs 12 and verse 18. There is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword but the tongue of the wise promotes health. Proverbs 15, verse 4, and I did mention that I'll go through these rather quickly for a split sermon. Proverbs 15, verse 4, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. There definitely is power in the tongue. Words mean things. Sometimes it might be hard to understand that the encouraging words that people speak can go such a long way. Anyone can speak words that tend to rob someone of the spirit to continue in difficult times. But very special is the individual who has learned to uh, and takes time to encourage others. Words mean things. Here's a quote Billy Sunday said to the men in his audience, Begin to say encouraging things to your wife. At first, she'll be shocked. Here's another quote. I can live for two months on a good compliment. Most of you have heard that before. Very famous Mark Twain. I can live for two months on a good compliment, he would say. So point number one was our words can bring healing. Point two out of three. Our words can stop Quarrels and strife. Our words can stop quarrels and strife. Satan is on a constant mission to stir up matters of the heart that bring all kinds of troubles and break relationships in this world. His goal is to influence humanity to cheapen anything that is good and virtuous and pure. Of course, this also robs God of his glory when this happens. When we see humanity wallowing in strife and argument and debate and rudeness, crassness, vulgarity, indecency, all those things, just a few of Satan's tactics, and we know what some of his titles are that were revealed to us in the Bible. Just a few of his titles are Father of Lies, the Arch Deceiver, Apollyon the Destroyer, the Accuser of the Brethren. Satan doesn't quit, and he won't. When human beings cave into these kind of reactive emotions, Satan wins victories. But you and I have been called to peace and to what Stephen Covey would call proactive words. Proverbs 15, verse 1. Proverbs 15, verse 1. A soft answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. Again, this is a skill that we have been called to develop. It takes effort to master this. 
Proverbs 16, verse 32. Proverbs 16, verse 32. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit is better than he who takes a city, has the power to conquer a city. Someone who controls his anger has got more power and is better off than a person who can conquer a city. Proverbs 17, verse 1. Proverbs 17, verse 1. Better is a dry mor- morsel with quietness than a house full of feasting with strife. Far better to have empty cupboards in the kitchen and have a strife-filled house than have a house full of good things in abundance where there's conflict going on. Proverbs 19, verse 11. Proverbs 19, verse 11. The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook a transgression. Now, we realize this is not criminal transgression. We're talking about things that people get into arguments over and debates and uh, and contentions, or things that people might uh, throw a slur at you out on the street or, or say something uh, vulgar or uh, distasteful or undignified to you. This is just something, one of those things where you, you walk away, you brush it off. That's what we're talking about here, overlooking a transgression. Verse, Proverbs 20, verse 3. Proverbs 20, verse 3. It is honorable for a man to stop striving, since any fool can start a quarrel. This, again, speaks to learning and studying and practicing and building a skill. Any fool can start a quarrel, but an honorable man will stop striving. Please turn with me and hold a place in Proverbs, if you would. Uh, Let's go to Matthew 18, verse 1. Matthew 18, verse 1. I'll put my marker in here. Someday I might find a way to get a whole stack of little... uh, bookmarks for everyone just to say, oh, good, Mr. Moen has supplied the whole congregation with like, everyone gets five each. (laughs) We'll see. Uh, No promise here, but I'm going to see if I can't keep an eye open for a whole slew of bookmarkers. Matthew 18, verse 1. It's a teachable moment here. Uh, Jesus Christ uses the example of the attitude of innocence of a little child to teach a a lesson about lorditing over others and uh, and how the... uh, the world's authorities practice their rulership in different ways than Christians do, or how we're called to be apart from that. And so it says in verse 1 of Matthew 18, at that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus calls a little child to him and set him in the midst. So we see all the disciples maybe in a circle. Jesus is Maybe sitting down, he puts a child on his knee, perhaps, or standing next to the child. He says, verse 3, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you're converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 5, And whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. But whoever calls one of these little ones to believe in me, who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto those who cause offense, he's saying. Verse 7, woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. Yes, we live in a In an increasingly evil world, yes, offenses will continue to get worse. But woe to that man by whom the offenses come. And so that is a take heed statement that Jesus Christ helps us to grow in these areas of life. I won't turn, but Psalm 133 in verse 1 is also a very well-known psalm. It should be. Psalm 133 verse 1, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Uh, Of course, one of our hymns in our hymnal speaks to that. Another verse I won't turn to, Colossians 3, verse 15. Colossians 3, verse 15. 
the NIV version says, for as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. This is our calling. This is our responsibility. This is our, our path of growth. We've been called to live in peace. Isaiah 52, verse 7, another reference. Isaiah 52, verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things. You could also say who promotes peace. And also cheers, what's the good word? You remember when Tevia in Fiddler on the Roof, that was one of my favorite lines of his. He'd go up and have his cart and his horse, he's delivering milk, and he'd say to a group of people, what's the good word? I like that. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was a phrase that he'd use a couple of times in the, uh, in the movie, and it stuck with me because it's like, tell me something good today. Tell me something positive. What's a good thing that happened to you today? I mean, that's, that's, that's bringing tid uh, glad tidings of good things. Who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. I'm finishing that, that point uh, or that uh, passage. So point number two out of three was how we choose our words can stop quarrels and strife. And if we're in training to become kings and priests, as also was mentioned in the first split sermon, or a kingdom of priests, developing this skill is essential to our future roles. It's essential that we build these skills. Point number three out of three, our words indicate what is in our hearts. Our words indicate what is in our heart, singular, okay, singular. Because out of the heart, the mouth speaks, we're told. Why is God concerned about the words we speak? Because our words convey and reflect what is in our hearts. Here's a quote uh, from someone anonymous. A physician looks at the tongue, a human tongue, to de determine some of the conditions of the human body. God says, in effect, let me see your tongue to determine your spiritual condition. There was a minister my wife and I had years and years ago in Pasadena who would often say the tongue is the dipstick to the heart. The tongue is the dipstick to the heart. Very clever thought if you think of the visual imagery of that. It, it's kind of strange at first, but <laughs> it fits. Proverbs 10 and verse 19. Please come back to Proverbs now. Proverbs 10 and verse 19. God says he is judging us on the use of our words. Proverbs 10 and verses 19 through 21. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. But he who restrains his lips is wise. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The heart of the wicked is worth little. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of wisdom. You see the nourishing imagery here of the good use of positive words, encouraging words, helpful words, healing words. They feed, in a certain sense, people to uplift and encourage. But in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. Uh, I mentioned earlier we're in an information age where, where words are getting cheaper and cheaper because there's uh, such a plethora of, of, of communication we have to sift through these days. In Matthew 12 and verse 33, uh, I won't turn, but the context here is the Pharisees were slandering Jesus Christ claiming that he only had the power of Satan to cast out demons, only by the power of Beelzebub. And then, of course, Jesus Christ had to come back and tell them, uh, you know, that's not correct. Uh, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. He was saying, uh, have you seen me do anything wicked, anything? And you here you're claiming that I cast out demons by the power of Satan? He says, verse 34, brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. 
Verse 36 says, But I say to you that for every idle word that men speak, they will give account for in the day of judgment. Every idle word. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned, he said. Now, he had a target audience at that moment, but is there a principle for all of us to take away? What are idle words? Well, I looked up several commentaries just to see what they said. I mean, it was nothing new for us, I won't believe, but Eliot's commentary, it says, every idle, in other words, every useless and purposeless word. Benson's commentary, vain, useless, meaning careless, unprofitable conversation. Barnes notes, this literally means a vain, thoughtless, useless word, a word that accomplishes no good. Here it means evidently wicked, injurious, false, malicious. For such were the words which they, the Pharisees, had spoken. Once again, he's speaking directly to an audience when he says this. But he also includes this to be a general statement that people will be judged praise or condemnation for the words they use. God is not saying we don't have to have a lighthearted and humorous conversation and tell jokes and uh, anecdotes. He's just saying things that pull people down, things that rob God of his glory, things that are critical, uh, attacks, and uh, things that are wicked, injurious, and false, and malicious. That's what he's saying here. Now, God, of course, will forget and remove and blot out and erase anything that we repent of. We may have offended people in words. In many words, we offend much, we're told in James 3, verse 2. We stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble, say the wrong thing in word, he's a perfect person already, fully developed in character and in self-control. Well, this is what we're striving for, able to bridle the whole body. But we stumble, and if we have offended our brother in word or in deed, our children, our wives, our husbands, a coworker, our duty is to go to them and ask for forgiveness. Sometimes asking for God's forgiveness must include going to our brother to reconcile with our brother. Now, God listens to our words. I'd like to turn finally to a passage in Malachi 3, verse 16. Malachi 3, 16. God is listening to our words. It's part of point three here. Okay. Malachi 3, verse 16. Malachi is sent to Judah about a hundred years after the Jews, the contingent of Jews that wanted to return back to Jerusalem and Judah and start rebuilding, rebuild the temple in Zerubbabel's day. Here it is a hundred years later. And there are about six issues that God needs to address, problem issues with the people. They need correction, but at the same time, he offers them this insightful encouragement it's a promise of hope that God gives through Malachi. God would grant to those who fear him the reward of eternal life in his kingdom. They would be identified in a registry called a book of remembrance. And the book of remembrance is a reference to the book of life. Those who are in the book of life will be given eternal life. Now this verse tells us that God is listening to the words we speak. He says to the prophet Malachi, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. God has, is keeping a book of remembrance, which is the book of life. He listens and he hears us. And this, is, of course, is a context of those who were faithful in an otherwise wicked society. Those who kept faith and who conversed with one another, uplifted one another, helped uh, guide each other through difficult times and... These are positive words that God is praising them for. I won't turn, but in Colossians 4 and verse 5, 
as we draw to a close here, Colossians 4 and verse 5 and 6, Paul says, walk in wisdom toward those who are on the outside, meaning non-believers, redeeming the time, making the best of our time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to, you ought to answer each person. Also, Isaiah 58, verse 12 says this. Isaiah 58, verse 12. Those from among you shall build the old waste places. This is a millennial verse. It projects into a millennial setting. Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to dwell in the repairer of the breach. A lot of that is words, not just construction projects. It is healing, broken relationships, building people up, getting people to work together towards common goals. It's a very visionary uh, topic that God's people in offices of kings and priests in the kingdom of God, bringing words of healing and hope and instruction to nations. So point number three. Our words indicate what is truly going on in our hearts. To conclude, we've been called to learn how to speak life to those who cross our paths, those who are close to us as well as those who are on the outside. Again, it's been said that learning to communicate with one another is a most important skill to learn in life. The words we speak to each other has the power to either tear down relationships or build up and heal relationships. Words can be a power, powerful raging fire of destruction or the bridges that heal and restore and build up. God is grooming us for eternity. Aren't we to be separating from the ways of this world and not follow the same path of words that tear down and quarrels and dissensions that rob peace and unity? God wants us to break out of the negativity of the world around us. And he offers us the power to overcome in prayer and through the Holy Spirit. He wants us to be an example to the world around us and to each other and bring him the glory because words mean things. <laughs>